Hey, uh, welcome to the sanctuary, whether you're uh, watching online or you're here in person. Uh, we're really glad that you're here and you're connected with us. If you are at home, hopefully uh, you remember to get some bread and wine. So when we have communion, we remember that we're all one body. Uh, even, if you're, even if you're watching this three years from now, get some bread and wine because uh, we're connected beyond space and time. Pretty cool. But anyway, uh, good to see you. Did you know that there is a fount of every blessing? Did you know that? Uh, every good and perfect gift comes from our, fa our Father, the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow or variation due to change. So there is a fount of every blessing, and we should probably stand up and ask him to come here and tune our hearts to sing his praise, okay? So would you stand up and uh, sing this song and call your hearts to worship? Yeah, okay.
and be seated. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time that we just get to be in your presence. We get to gather together. And Lord, we get to center our hearts upon you. After maybe what would be a long week, God, we get to come to this place of worship, to the sanctuary. And Lord, we're reminded by your voice that we are your children, that you love us, that you're pleased with us. And Lord, no matter what happened throughout this week or what we have coming up next week, Lord, can we just be present here in this moment? Can we be present to your grace that is overflowing in our hearts? Can we be present to your love? Can we be present to your life? So God, we thank you this morning for your words of truth, for the company of fellow believers in the midst of each, each other, Lord, worshiping together. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you have given us. And today, Lord, I just leave some space to pray out a prayer request, but also maybe just to speak a blessing. God, can we, can, we, can we use this space to just worship you? So, Lord, I leave space for whoever wants to speak out this morning. Father, I thank you for how Marine May's friends are blessing her now. And I pray that she would rest in your presence in the, abs- in the absence of Jim's physical presence. And Lord, I thank you for how my cousin-in-law Lucy is looking to you in Tom's absence. Lord God, I pray that you would fill up all these empty places that are being exposed through um, uh, death and disease in just the recent weeks. Father, we give you ourselves, and we give you this time. Lord, we surrender to your spirit in these moments. Thank you, God, for being with us today. Thank you for going before us. Thank you for surrounding us and caring for us in ways that we don't even see. Lord, we love you, and we know that you love us. And so we pray this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary, and it's just good to be together. It's good to worship together this morning, whether you're in person or online. uh, It's just great to be in the presence of Christ together. Um, I don't know about you guys, but this was kind of a week for me where I felt like I needed to just take a deep breath. And so we're just going to do that together this morning. Could you just take maybe a couple deep breaths this morning and really allow yourself to just be present in these in these moments as we kind of just breathe. You know, breath is, is such a, an amazing and beautiful thing. Uh, you know, that, that Jesus, uh, God breathes the breath of life into us and, and at the same time, he breathes us into himself. Right? It's, it's like this, this, we're being gathered together and he's, he's forming us by his breath. And then he's not only breathing us in, but he's actually breathing us out. And, and he breathes us out upon the world to be a blessing. So as we gather together, you might think of it as he's inhaling, he's breathing us in. And then as we leave this morning, he's exhaling us into the world to be a blessing. So uh, I have a couple of announcements for us this morning. We have um, an Ash Wednesday service. It'll be Wednesday, uh, February 17th is the date, and it's going to be at 7 p.m., and it will be here at the church. 
Um, but it will also be online. So if you want to participate in the service in person or online, um, you'll be able to do that. Uh, this, is, this is a really cool service. So I've heard. I haven't been here for this service, but I've heard from multiple people that this is one of their favorite services to come to. Um, it, it, it's, if you haven't been to this service, it's a little more of, of a reflective, kind of a self-examination, more of a somber and kind of dark service. Um, Ash Wednesday is actually the start of Lent, and Lent leads us in to this kind of this 40-day period, um, and, and it really kind of reflects the 40-day period of Jesus' um, temptation in the wilderness. And, and then it leads us to Easter, and, um, and so it, it, if you haven't been a part of the service in the past, it, it's more of a uh, experiential service. So we're going to have some prayer stations around. We're going to have some ways that you're going to be able to kind of physically get involved um, in COVID-friendly ways as well. So I would really encourage you to be a part of this service um, in person or online. We're going to have th these prayer stations uh, in both places. So but yeah, 7 p.m. Um, Wednesday, February 17th. So that'd be great if you would join us. And then another way to connect this week is we have our Wednesday night class uh, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. And it's on Zoom right now. And uh, we're doing a, a series called What is the Bible? And this week we're doing What are the Prophets? And so we're going to be talking a little bit about the prophet, the prophetic literature, and, um, and, and what that means. So if you want to join in on that service, you can email me, chris at the sanctuary downtown. Dot org and, um, and I'll get you the Zoom link for that. So as we move into our time of offering, um, I was thinking about this this week. You know, it, it's, sometimes it feels awkward for me to stand up here. It almost feels like a sales pitch, right? And, and, but I was thinking that that's, this is not at all what it is. Our offering is, is, is financial and it's with our resources, yes, but it really is us offering ourselves as well. And it's our offering ourselves to one another. It's offering ourselves to the church. But it's also offering ourselves to our neighbors and to the people that we meet every day. And so this morning, uh, we have these baskets in the back. And, and um, if you want to drop a check in there or some cash in there on your way out or, or this morning while we're doing our offertory song, that would be so appreciated by the church. And it just continues to allow us to do things in ministry um, with, with your gifts and with all of our gifts. And so I would just say, you know, as this offertory song is playing, that you would just think about the ways that you can offer yourself to the Lord this morning. So let's continue in worship together. i 
And so, Lord God, we thank you for that song, number 32, in the Presbyterian hymnal. (laughs) And uh, this is our offering, Lord. That's our offering. We confess to you that we've wrapped ourselves in fig leaves and we've hidden from the wounds on our neighbor and on our own bodies, and we have become comfortably numb. So, Lord God, would you speak your word to us? We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I shall divine the answer to this question. Yes, having never... (laughs) Snoopy and Woodstock. Snoopy and Woodstock. (laughs) Who's running the state of California while Jerry Brown is out campaigning for president? (laughs) Wouldn't it be great to be a prophet like Karnak the Magnificent? You're sitting at a bar, and, and you would know stuff. You, you always want to know stuff when you're sitting at a bar. Sitting at a, at a bar, everyone's stressed about the election, and you could just tell folks who's going to win. Your friend is stressed about whether or not to marry her boyfriend, and you could tell her whether he was good or evil. That'd be cool. Uh, You get a bad job review. Don't cry. Prophesy. Mm. The the Lord says that that you're wrong and I'm right and and you have daddy issues and a drinking problem which clouds your judgment. See? Pretty cool. The Bible contains all sorts of prophecy. And some of the books of the Bible are written by folks that are called prophets. Some of those are known as major prophets because of the length of their books. The three longest are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And I think they're especially fascinating because they not only reveal what the prophets said, but how they came to say it. How they said it and how they came to say it. Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. He hears the seraphim singing, the whole earth is filled with his glory. The foundation of the threshold trembles. A burning coal purifies his lips. A voice calls saying, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I. Pretty awesome, huh? 
the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and talks to him. That's right, a walking, talking word who puts out his hand, touches Jeremiah's mouth, and says, I have set you this day over nations and kingdoms. <laughs> That's awesome, huh? Ezekiel sees a glowing cloud full of wind and fire and lightning. Four living, you know, this is the stuff that's on the History Channel when they talk about the ancient aliens. They love this. Four living creatures with human faces, four tremendous wheels full of eyes reaching down to the earth, and above it all, a throne, and over the throne, a rainbow, and on the throne, a man, but a man made of like fire and light or molten bronze or gold, the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man. Totally cool, incredible. So wouldn't it be great to be a prophet? But isn't it absurd that some claim to be prophets? You know, this really wasn't a very good year for folks that advertise themselves as prophets. And it seems to me it hasn't gone well for these folks for quite some time. In 1988, Edgar Wisenant sold 4.5 million copies of his book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. 1988 was one 40-year generation from the foundation of the nation state that calls itself Israel. 300,000 copies of his book were mailed to pastors throughout the United States. In 1989, he published the final shout, Rapture Report 1989, 89 reasons why the rapture will be in 1989. In 1993, he published a book on why the date was actually 1993. In 1994, he published one more book predicting nuclear war, total meltdown in 1994. End times books are a remarkably easy way to get rich, especially if you equate modern Israel with the Israel of God quote the revelation out of context, include some stuff from the Olivet Discourse in Matthew and Luke, while ignoring the fact that Jesus appears to have said this stuff would happen within one generation and appears to actually have happened in 70 AD when Rome sacked Jerusalem. But of that day and hour, the close of the age, no one knows, according to Jesus, not even Hal Lindsey or Jerry Jenkins or Tim LaHaye. I'm pretty sure he said that. Anyway, we make all these end times maps, plotting out the path for avoiding tribulation and the end, when Jesus says, I am the end. And in this world you will have tribulation. So pick up a cross and follow. You know, the word rapture doesn't even appear in my English Bible. And no one even knew what a pre-tribulation rapture was until about 150 years ago in the United States and Great Britain. See, I think it's all a bit suspect. And now, in just the last two weeks, the mental gymnastics undertaken by supposed prophets who prophesied that Trump would be inaugurated on January 20th, I mean, those gymnastics have been just utterly astounding if you follow this stuff. And more than a bit suspect. But now listen very close to me. Many of the prophecies about Donald Trump may have been true. He got elected the first time when nobody thought that he would get elected. God still might use him to turn the hearts of America toward himself. I mean, that's the kind of, God does that kind of stuff. I mean, just look at the story of King David or uh, Nebuchadnezzar of, of Babylon. But if a prophet prophesied that Trump would be inaugurated on January 20, 2021, that prophet was wrong. Moses prophesied, saying, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Deuteronomy 18, verse 22, and God spells out some pretty drastic punishment for presumptuous prophets. You do not want to be a presumptuous prophet. Now, I don't think we're still commanded to kill false prophets. You know, if we paid attention, we sure would pay a, save a lot of money on end times books. We would. 
And maybe also we'd stop taking the name of the Lord in vain. So anyway, wouldn't it be great to be a prophet? But isn't it absurd that some claim to be prophets? So should we not despise prophecy? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20. Do not despise prophecies. Now, I should mention that if it weren't for some very detailed and extensive prophetic words, which I received starting along about 2006, I don't think that there would be a sanctuary. And I think I may very well have killed myself. I should also mention that I think my wife is a prophet. And she gets perturbed with me when I say that because folks want her to tell her stuff. And she says to me, Peter, I don't know stuff unless God tells me stuff. And that's, that's really true. But when it happens, it's just utterly amazing to me because you see, I know her. I know her. And she's been known to deceive me a bit about credit cards and crap she buys at Pottery Barn and the details of our shared diet plans. <laughs> and then she'll say something like, Peter, I just heard God say such and such, and I know she didn't make it up. Because half the time, she doesn't know what she's, what she has no clue as to what it means, and yet it's utterly profound. She's quoted Bible verses to me that I'm almost positive she's never read. See, that's like cheating, seriously. I think it's cheating. Well, anyway, 1 Thessalonians 5.20, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Another word for that might be science. Test everything. When people say the Bible's opposed to science, it reveals that they have not understood science and they probably haven't spent hardly any time reading their Bible. Don't believe every spirit, writes John. Test, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So if they said something will happen, and it did not happen, they were lying, and they knew it, which means they were conning you, or they were lying and didn't know it, which means they were mistaken, or they were lying and kind of knew it and kind of didn't know it. Maybe they thought that faith you know, was all about like psyching yourself up and then just saying the first thing that pops into your head. Maybe they did hear something, but didn't come from God. Once Susan heard something very specific, and I remember I said, wow, honey, that's incredible, but that doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. And we prayed together, and really in a rather kind of miraculous sort of way, discovered that it wasn't Jesus, but it had been a demon that was speaking. <laughs> it was saying, be afraid. Be very, very, very afraid. Sometimes people will get a prophetic word and do a bad job of communicating that word. And so it's important to say, tell me exactly what you heard. Often I'll discover it's actually an amazing word that they heard, but they didn't know what it meant, and so they kind of just provided their, their own meaning. Sometimes people will get a prophetic word, and you should believe the word, but you should definitely not trust or follow the person that gave the word. One of the greatest prophetic words ever spoken uh, was that one man should die, quote, for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. John eleven fifty. It was spoken by Caiaphas, who then went on to crucify Jesus. In Numbers 22, Balaam's ass prophesies to Balaam the greedy prophet. In Second Peter, Peter points out that God can still use asses, but that doesn't mean that you should follow them or be one. First Thessalonians 5, 20, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So you see, it is important to know good from evil, but how should we get that knowledge? Do we just take it like fruit from a tree? Take it, consume it, and use it as we desire? So wouldn't it be great to be a prophet? But isn't it absurd that some claim to be prophets? So shouldn't we despise prophecy? No. In fact, you should pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. 
Those are the words of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. And so we say, okay, but then how, how do we prophesy? Well, I'm glad that, that you asked. Thank you. How to prophesy. Now, I need to say I'm a little bit nervous about this because folks uh, write long and detailed books about this. There are entire schools devoted to this stuff, and people pay lots of money for information on this topic. But right now, I'm just going to tell you in like three, three steps. That's really one step. Ready? Number one, tell people what God tells you to tell people. Tell the truth. Now, you may think that I'm being snarky, and maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. But this seems to be a major sticking point for us, especially in 2021. It's important to note that Balaam's ass never took a class on prophecy. As far as I can tell, neither Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Moses, or any other prophets took a class on how to, how to prophesy. But listen closely, classes are fine and classes are, are good. I mean, right now, this is kind of like a little, little class we're having right now, but these prophets, they don't take a class on how to hear the Word of God and how to speak the Word of God. The Word of God just like takes them and tells them to speak. And surprisingly, how to speak, and each time it seems to be a little bit different. But they don't take knowledge of good and evil, consume it and use it for their own purposes, and yet wisdom seems to take them and use them for his own purposes. They don't take the truth like it's fruit on a tree. If anything, the truth takes them, and they cannot help but worship. And by that I mean they're honest. They don't control the truth, but they let the truth control them. That's called honesty. So if you say, I don't know what God is telling me to tell them, well then tell them. I don't know what God is telling me to tell you. And if you say, well, I do have an idea what God might be telling me to tell them, then tell them. Hey, I do have an idea what God might be telling me to tell you. And if God appears to you on a throne in a vision and tells you exactly what to tell them, say, God appeared to me on a throne in a vision and he told me exactly what to tell you, then tell them exactly. Well, anyway, Paul wrote, desire that you may prophesy. That means desire to know the truth and to speak truthfully, but how do we know the truth? How do we know the word of God? And that's number two. Let the word of God know you, the word of love. Now, hold that thought, because I'd I'd like to take a look at some of the prophets, particularly the big three, and show you what I mean by that. And while we're doing that, you might ask yourself, self, do I see any difference between these biblical prophets and the ones on TV? I mentioned the call and the commission of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Each time, it's truly awesome, right? God calls them, gives them the truth to tell, and then it just gets downright weird, really weird. Here's an example in Isaiah. Isaiah sees the Lord clothed in glory. He's purified by fire, speaks the word, then this, Isaiah 20, verse two. At that time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, go and loose the sackcloth from your waist and take off your sandals from your feet, and he did so walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, as my servant has walked naked and barefoot for three years, as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Cush, not Tush, Cush, which I think is Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian captives and the Cushite exiles, both the young and the old, naked and barefoot with buttocks uncovered, the nakedness of Egypt, then they shall be dismayed and ashamed because of Cush their hope and of Egypt their boast, and the inhabitants of this coastland, Israel, will say in that day, behold, this is what has happened to those in whom we hoped and to whom we fled for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria. And we, how shall we escape? You see, it's not enough that Isaiah knows about 
about what will happen to the Egyptians and the Ethiopians in whom Israel had trusted and about what will happen to um, the Israelites of the, of the northern kingdom. It's not enough to know and say that they will be exiled but naked. No, Isaiah has to prophesy but naked for three years. So Isaiah sees the word of God clothed in glory. Then Isaiah must like become the word of God but naked for three years. And Isaiah didn't do anything to deserve this. He's not from the northern kingdom. He's of the house of Judah, of the house and lineage of Judah. And things don't get easier for Jeremiah. God tells Jeremiah that he was chosen before birth to be set over nations and kingdoms, and yet Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, like a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. God calls him to prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem, which is also the destruction of Jeremiah. Chapter 15, he cries, Woe is me, my mother, that you bore me, that I was ever born, a man of strife and contention to the whole land. I have not lent, nor have I borrowed, yet all of them curse me. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy. And yet I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Then the Lord answers, If you utter what is precious, and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. Well, they don't appear to have turned to Jeremiah till after he was dead, having been tortured, thrown in a cistern, left to die, and then later exiled to Egypt, where he died. Last time, remember, we saw the king responded to Jeremiah and his secretary, Baruch. He burns a scroll and tries to imprison Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, he feels all of this deeply for himself and for the people. He cries, is there no balm in Gilead in chapter, chapter 8? In Jeremiah 27, Jeremiah is commanded by God to bear a yoke like, like a slave. It looks like the beam of, of a cross, and, and it's not what we would consider to be easy. He says, trap himself to that yoke and prophesy, renouncing the false prophets who say that no one else will have to bear a, a yoke and suffer like Jeremiah. <sighs> Wouldn't it be great to, to be a prophet? And check out Ezekiel. This is the one that blows me away. Ezekiel, you know, is among the captives now exiled from Judah to Babylon. So he's, he's at the Kibar Canal or something like that in Babylon when he has this outrageous vision of one like a son of man seated on the throne of heaven. The, the son of man calls Ezekiel son of man. That's a bit wild. Feeds Ezekiel a scroll, tells him to speak, and informs him that the house of Israel, which is uh, now just Judah at this point, he informs him, speak, and oh yeah, and by the way, Ezekiel, they will not listen to you, for they have not listened to me. And then he tells Ezekiel that he will not even be able to speak until he makes a model of Jerusalem under siege and does the following. Lie on your left side and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. You shall bear their punishment, havon, in, usually translated iniquity. You shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie there. For I assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of years of their punishment. And so you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel, the northern kingdom. And remember, this has already happened. They've been sent off to Assyria long ago. When you have have completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, forty days I assign you, one day for each year. You shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and with your arm bared you shall prophesy against it. See, I am putting cords on you, so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have completed the days of your siege. Four hundred and thirty days. The Lord then tells Ezekiel he gets a pint of water every day and a small allotment of grain and beans which he is to cook over a fire of human dung. 
And now I love this. Ezekiel complains to the Lord, saying, <laughs> to the Lord of hosts, he complains. Says, That's just going too far. And the Lord of hosts says, okay, you can use cow dung. Well, anyway, Ezekiel not only <laughs> prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem, you see, he feels the destruction of Jerusalem. As he looks at an image of Jerusalem from the standpoint of Israel and from the standpoint of um, Judah and from the standpoint of God, Jerusalem is the Lord's bride and the temple is her holy place. In chapter 24, the Lord informs Ezekiel that this is, that his own beloved bride, that Ezekiel's bride, quote, the delight of his eyes, that's what I guess he called her. He informs Ezekiel that she will die. And then immediately after, Ezekiel is to prophesy that the temple in the heart of Jerusalem will be profaned. Whew. You see, the prophets don't just speak a word. They experience the word that they speak. It seems to like live in them or maybe die in them and then live in them. They feel the pain of evil. They long for the good who is the life. They don't just know the word. It's like they're known by the word. And it's not just Old Testament prophets. St. Paul writes about prophecy most extensively to the Corinthians, who of all the folks in Scripture remind me most of us uh, evangelical American Christians, because, well, they're kind of infants. They're all about spiritual gifts and not interested, uninterested in love. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You're not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. See, the Corinthians knew truths, but they would not surrender their hearts to the truth. They knew about the word, but they refused to be known by the word. They knew about procedures and laws and policies and rules, and they wouldn't surrender to love. They would not allow the word of love to know them, to affect them. What you doing there? <laughs> what I'm doing here is trying to determine when I'm going to die. Uh, a lot of people are working on that research. <laughs> but seriously, if, even if I disregard the Uncle Carl factor, at best I have 60 years left. How long, huh? 60 only takes me to here. I need to get to here. What's there? The earliest estimate of the singularity, when man will be able to transfer his consciousness into machines and achieve immortality. So you're upset about missing out on becoming some sort of freakish self-aware robot? By this much? <laughs> In order to live long enough to fuse my consciousness with cybernetics, I need to change my diet. Right, cybernetics is robot stuff, right? Correct. So you want to turn yourself into some sort of robot? Essentially, yes. <laughs> okay, here's my question. Didn't you already do that? <laughs> Flattering, but sadly, no. Sheldon, are you gonna join us? Coming. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Greetings, whatever the hell you are. I am a mobile virtual presence device. Uh, recent events have demonstrated to me that my body is too fragile to endure the vicissitudes of the world. Until such time as I am able to transfer my consciousness, I shall remain in a secure location and interact with the world in this manner. This may seem a little odd at first, but over time, you'll grow accustomed to dealing with me in this configuration. Yeah, to be honest, I don't see much difference. Thank you. That's what I was going for. <laughs> I find that old clip to be slightly prophetic for 2021. 
And don't get me wrong, I really think you should practice social distancing. I, I believe that you should, and I believe that that's good, but I think we should all be very aware of our tendency to turn ourselves into mobile virtual presence devices. Mobile virtual presence devices so afraid to die that we never actually live, and so entirely unfit to prophesy the resurrection and the life, the gospel. I mean, isn't it a bit odd that we've spent billions of dollars on books prophesying a pre-tribulation rapture so that we would not be affected by the tribulation and have to pick up a cross and follow? Isn't it ironic that we're into all this prophecy about the old city of Jerusalem on the other side of the world when Jesus died to make his, his bride right here and right now, his new Jerusalem? And isn't it a bit embarrassing that we get so worked up about presidents when we're called to testify to the king who reigns in our hearts, feels our every sorrow, and longs to know us as the, great, as the bridegroom knows his bride? See this man hanging on a tree in a garden. Do you know him? How do you know him? Is he information that you can take and use to keep your soul safe and unaffected by the pain of this world? Or do you know him because he's known you and you've become his sanctuary, his bride, his body, and even his life, speaking his word, which is the truth? This is eternal life, prayed Jesus, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, writes Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that, if, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul mourns the destruction of Jerusalem and his fellow Jews who torture him and chain him in stocks. But then he writes this, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Isn't it strange how we prophesy hell for other people and don't even shed a tear? While Paul felt unceasing anguish and sorrow for his kinsmen, according to the flesh, and offered to be accursed, in their place. You know, Jesus prophesied hell, Hades and Gehenna, more than any other prophet in all of Scripture, and then he descended into hell. For as Isaiah writes, he numbered himself with the transgressors. <laughs> That's me and you. Well, the prophets prophesied temporal pain, but also a universe of eternal joy. It was old butt-naked Isaiah who prophesied this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord because he's clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness. Imagine how that felt on old butt-naked Isaiah. He also prophesied that after the destruction of all our good deeds, human flesh, even earth and heaven, he said that they'd wear out like a garment or be burned in the valley of Gehenna. After that, we will all be adorned in garments of praise. We'll worship as one. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, prophesies that Gehenna will one day be inside the new Jerusalem. God's law will be placed within our hearts and we will all know him. <laughs> We're all going to be grafted into the house of Israel and we will all know him. And in that day, God will give us gladness for our sorrow and, quote, our mourning will actually be turned into joy. That means our joy is actually constructed with our sorrow. So if you never mourn, you'll never know or be known by joy. 
But just imagine how much joy will be known by Jeremiah. If you're comfortably numb, if you've become a virtual mobile presence device, if you have a heart of stone, you can't know joy. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, says the Lord through Ezekiel. Ezekiel, who was commanded to feel the utter destruction of Israel, is then also commanded to prophesy to the bones of Israel, which would include the bones of his delight, his bride, and God's delight, God's bride, Jerusalem, son of man. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Whole house, says the Lord. Ezekiel 37, 11. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and you will rise from your graves, O my people, and I will place my spirit within you, says the Lord through Ezekiel, and I will put you in your land, says the Lord through Ezekiel, and they will say this land has become like the Garden of Eden, says the Lord through Ezekiel. Imagine how that felt for Ezekiel. It's like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel experience the very passion of our Lord Jesus the Christ and then the very unmitigated, ecstatic, resurrected glory that belongs only to him. I mean, it's like they die with him and rise with him. See, you can't die with him if you're, you can't rise with him if you're unwilling to, to die with him the word of God. They don't simply know about the word of God. They're known by the word of God and they give birth to the word of God. They actually like incarnate the, the word of God. They love because they've been loved by the truth. So Paul tells the Corinthians to pursue love and desire to prophesy. Then later he tells them that they're restricted in their own affections. And to them he writes this, if we are afflicted, it is for your salvation. For we know that as you share in our suffering, pathema, our passion, you will also share in our comfort, paraklesis. Jesus is our parakletos, our comforter, our helper. See, I think Paul is saying, you Corinthians, you, you Americans, you're restricted in your affections. But now you are afflicted that you might be affected by evil and yearn, 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 long for the good who will fill you with his life and cause you to manifest his word uh, to prophesy. So, have you been afflicted? Have you felt naked, exposed? like Isaiah? Have you wept like Jeremiah at the destruction of your nation, your city? Have you lost a loved one like Ezekiel or Jesus? See, I'm just saying that maybe you've been afflicted so that you might be affected hate the evil, call on the good, surrender to his word, and give birth to his word, that is, prophesy. So back to our class. How to prophesy. Number one, tell people what God tells you to tell people. Be honest. Number two, let the word of God know you so that you might know the word and speak the word. In other words, Love as you have been loved. Prophecy is speaking the truth in love. And now I should mention that there are many forms of prophecy. Once in my life, I heard words, I think like my wife has heard words. I think God did that just so that I'd listen to her, you know what I mean? And believe it. But only once have I, have I heard words like that, and yet I think I have prophesied. I think it's happened in sermons, and I'm convinced this happens in, it's happened in, in prayer for people where there were things that would manifest and make me realize, okay, that wasn't just me. I think it's, I think it's happened, but, but it hasn't happened, or, 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 or when it did happen, it wasn't when I was worried about whether or not it would happen. 
It wasn't when I was worried about whether or not I could hear the voice of God or whether or not I could prophesy. It happened when I felt what another person was feeling. And I think I felt in that moment what Jesus was feeling. In other words, I was affected by love. And so I hated the lie. I longed for the truth. And so I opened my mouth and I just spoke a word that I, that I hoped would help. I spoke the gospel. Not as a law, but as love, like burning in my flesh. Not as law, but as love in my flesh. And I discovered it wasn't actually me that was speaking. (laughs) You know, God is love. And his word is the truth. Jesus. Number three, bear the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now that phrase, testimony of Jesus, can mean a testimony that you give about your experience of Jesus, and testimony of Jesus can also mean the testimony that Jesus gives through his spirit, the comforter, the helper, the parakletos within you, the testimony he gives. Now do you really think that Jesus is concerned that you would know the identity of the next president? in advance. Or is this all about something else? Some of you may remember our friend Ron Hege, who spoke to our church a few times several years ago. Ron's a paraplegic who's spoken to hundreds of thousands of youth around the world about the love of God. He, he broke his neck in high school diving into a wave in Southern California on vacation. Three months later, the doctors told him that he'd never ever walk again. When his parents left his hospital room that night, he was left alone, utterly alone except for an eight-year-old boy in a coma who hadn't spoken a word since he'd been hit by a car riding his bike. His name was Jimmy. Ron resented being left alone in a room with Jimmy, little eight-year-old Jimmy, the vegetable. Well, after his mother kissed him goodnight, told him that God had a plan and left the room, the dam just broke. Ron said he just began to weep uncontrollably. Sobbing, he cried out to God alone in the darkness, please let me die, please. I can't take care of myself. I can't dig a ditch. I I can't play football. I can't hug my girl. I can't hold her hand. What kind of a man is that? I'll only be a burden. Please, please, please let me die. And then in the darkness of his room, small, little, faltering voice, Ron, He tried to control his sobbing so he could hear. It was Jimmy. The only words that he would ever hear Jimmy speak. Ron. I love you. That was Jimmy, but not just Jimmy. That's prophecy. It was the word of God saving Ron and maybe even thousands of others who've heard him. I told you that there was a particular time in my life when I felt utterly rejected, abandoned, and misunderstood. And if it weren't for a host of prophetic words, I think I really might have killed myself. When I was a success, as the world measures, Success. Some people had this set of visions, a string of visions. The destruction of the church. One of them even right next to the destruction of Jerusalem. I hated the visions at the time. But when my entire world fell apart, I knew that God was in charge and I was still supposed to keep preaching. A few weeks before I was excommunicated for simply hoping that God might save all, A man told me that God told him that I was to read Jeremiah 15, verses 15 through 21. I ingested those words like broken bread and red wine. 
they still are like a balm to my soul. Several years ago, a friend, a friend who's here this morning, said to me, Peter, God wants you to read Isaiah 20, verses 1 through 6. At the time, I felt utterly naked, stripped of my pride and embarrassed to preach, and then I realized, well, this doesn't mean that I shouldn't preach. This means that I should preach. A couple years ago, I was ready to quit. I remember I just kept crying out to God saying, you have to speak to me. I sat down on the toilet. I picked up this old Bible, and it fell open to these words. Stand on your feet, O man, and I will speak to you. You shall speak my word to them whether they hear or they refuse to hear. Ezekiel chapter 2, the call of Ezekiel. I have too many prophetic stories to tell. The most amazing have really been words that have come through my wife, but none of the words have revealed any, any dates, at least as far as I can tell. Any dates concerning the rapture the politics of the Middle East, or who will be the next president, and yet they all reveal what I most desperately need to hear. Peter, I know you. Peter, I love you. And Peter, tell them who I am. I suspect that the greatest prophetic word in all of Scripture was spoken by a man who looked remarkably different than the prophets on TV. He, he spoke this word entirely naked, like Isaiah. He spoke it naked and nailed to a tree in a garden. He had carried the crossbeam up the hill, just like the yoke strapped to the back of Jeremiah. And like Jeremiah, he spoke the word when all refused to listen and uh, he returned his compassion with only curses. He was a curse for his brethren, his kinsmen by race. He spoke the word strapped naked to his yoke and gazing at his bride. He bore her iniquity, just like Ezekiel bore the iniquity of Jerusalem. She was his delight, and yet in tears he had prophesied her death. He lifted his head and said, Father, forgive. Then as the earth shook and the light failed, he prophesied one word to tell us thy. It is finished. And then he delivered up his spirit, the spirit of prophecy. He not only spoke the word, he is the word. He is the end. Shall we test that word? You know, maybe we do test that word all the time whenever we sin. And maybe that's what we're doing in time, but I know we will celebrate his victory for all eternity. We'll he cried, it is finished. So, so what is finished? What is finished? I, I suspect we will all die with him eventually. We will all die with him and rise with him and realize that we're finished. Death is no more, and all things are now new. That's the power of the word of God. And so that night, which was the beginning of that day, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the, the cup, saying, this is the covenant. The eternal covenant, it's called, in places in Scripture. This is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Did you know that you are the fulfillment of God's prophetic word? Man, woman, humanity, in his own image and likeness. Ingest his word. Speak his word, and you see, I think that's called prophecy. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, declares the Lord, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Maybe that day is this day. Amen. There is
to work. 
Lord God, I think I speak for myself and I think I speak for all of us when I say I am so grateful that you are love, God. That love is who you are and love is what you do. And that your word is truth and that truth was manifest, is manifest in Jesus. And so, Lord God, I ask you, we ask you to come sit on the throne in the sanctuary of our hearts. Infuse every word that we speak. And not only, Lord, that we would speak the word, but that we would be the incarnation of the word, your body, Lord Jesus, in this suffering world. Oh God, thank you that you will and you have clothed us with your righteousness. Thank you, Lord God, that our sorrow will actually be transformed into joy. Thank you, Lord God, that we will be your Jerusalem, for in fact, we actually are your Jerusalem, a Jerusalem that's coming down even now as we speak. So, Lord God, you are good, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, really, uh, classes are good. They're helpful. But more importantly, worship God. Worship Him like we were just doing. I mean, you sing it or meditate on Him, think about Him, and you will prophesy, I think. Uh, uh, Paul even said, you can all prophesy one by one in the middle of Corinthians. It's, so, it's 12, 13, and 14. You should read it when, when you get home. Um, we have folks here that, that prophesy, let me say that. And, and I mean by that, that, that some have gifts of words of knowledge. Sometimes people have visions. Uh, people like me, hardly ever, I don't think I've ever had a vision, had that word once, but I know that God has um, spoken through me. Um, so the classes can be helpful, but, but really in, in the end, like I say to our group that's prophetic, I, I really just want you to do three things. Be honest, number one. And number two, um, let the Lord love you so that you will love other people. And then number three, let me just remind you, you are the testimony of Jesus. So uh, everything I'm saying is really just believe the gospel and you'll become the gospel. Amen. Amen.